describe the Acts of the Apostles is simply to say it's, it's a beautiful, wonderful early history of the church, you know? Because he really accounts uh, in there and, and gives us ideas of what the early church was about back in the first century. After Jesus died and rose from the dead and went back to heaven, then uh, the bulk of the work then to spread the, the spread the message of Jesus landed on those, particularly the apostles and other disciples of Jesus. And so Luke uh, comes on the scene, so to speak, and so he decides he wants to write kind of a history of how our church got started, and that's in the Acts of the Apostles. So if you got the Acts of the Apostles, you notice the, the first part, chapter 1 says, the preparation for the Christian mission. Turn the page, I got some pictures there of the, the Sea of Galilee and the Mount of the Ascension. What I want to do is go over to, to the next page, uh, chapter 2, the coming of the Spirit. We'll just start right there, okay? This is on the bottom of page 181, chapter 2. When the time for Pentecost was fulfilled, they were all in one place together. And suddenly there came from the sky a noise, like a strong driving wind, and it filled the entire house in which they were. Then there appeared to them tongues as of fire, which parted and came to rest on each of them, meaning the twelve apostles. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in different languages as the Spirit enabled them to proclaim. So that was really, that's considered to be, that, that, that's the feast day of Pentecost, by the way. Um, and that's really considered to be the birthday of our church. Okay, Because prior to that time, don't forget, you know, when those, those early apostles of Jesus, they were scared, weren't they? Because they thought the Roman soldiers were going to come after them. And the Jewish people who were not part of wanting to follow Jesus, you know. And so these early these early disciples of Jesus, they were not real, they were not real comfortable going outside. You know what I mean? Because they knew what happened to Jesus. Uh, they knew the, the an, antagonism of so many people against Jesus and what he was preaching and teaching. And so those early apostles, they were scared. And so they just kind of gathered together in one place and stayed there. At night, probably somebody would run out and get a sandwich and come back, you know. It was, it was, they was that fearful of them, you know. Well then, as, as Luke recorded for us here in the Acts of the Apostles, the Holy Spirit came upon them and gave them that energy, gave them the strength, if you will, to go out and start proclaiming the message. Of course, pretty much all the apostles were murdered, you know. They all were martyred, except John. St. John, the apostle, is the only one who died a natural death. All the other of the, of the apostles, they all died. They were all tortured, killed in some way. But then they, of course, got other people, you know. They got other people to, to pick up what Jesus had taught. And so if you look then, to what, what was it like? What was that thing like anyway? Well, if you look at chapter 2 again, I want to get this one part right. On the top of page 183, this is just before chapter 3 of the Acts of the Apostles. You see it? It's called Communal Life. And this is how these people got along. This is how they got along. They devoted themselves to the teaching of the Apostles and to the communal life, to the breaking of the bread and to prayers. This is what they called, back in those days, they called the Eucharist celebrating Mass, we call it, you know celebrating the Eucharist, they call it the breaking of the bread. And this was an early, that's the verbiage they used. All the way for a long, long time, they used that idea of people got together for the breaking of the bread. Now they did that in, in uh, secret, you know. Usually they would get together at night in somebody's house. I'll talk about that in a little bit here. They would get together, and they, a priest would come or one of the bishops would come, and they would celebrate the Eucharist, which we call Mass. Okay? They would, they would celebrate the Eucharist, and they called it, we're getting together for the breaking of the bread. Usually, as I said, this was done at night. Um, they didn't feel real brave, I guess, to go out and to do that because there were no churches. There were no Catholic churches built until after 313. 
So they had to use people's homes, you know? So this is how, this is how we got started 2,000 years ago, okay? And so this is what it says there, that communal life. They got together for the breaking of the bread and to, for their prayers. All came upon everyone, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. For example, they would sell their property and possessions and divide them among all according to one's needs. Every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple area, to breaking the bread in their homes. They ate their meals with exultation and sincerity of heart, praising God and enjoying favor with all the people. And every day the Lord added to their number those who were being saved, those who were being baptized. So that's how, that's how we got started. It's kind of interesting to think about that. You know, it was 2,000 years ago. And that's how our church got started. Um, with these men, the apostles, and some other followers uh, getting together, praying, celebrating the Eucharist, which they call the breaking of the bread, and then trying to tell other people as best they could without any danger to their own life because they were all scared, you know. So they had to try to, to uh, tell people about the Christian faith, about what Jesus had taught, you see? And, but they had to do that very carefully. But they were successful because more and more people joined them, you know? More and more people started coming into our faith, okay? So let me tell you a little bit about, so I just wanted to read that much to you. If you want to take this home, you know, take your Bibles home and, and if you have a chance, just read that first part of the Acts of the Apostles. It tells you an awful lot about our history, you know. I guess if you want a good history of the Catholic Church, there it is in the Acts of the Apostles written by, by St. Luke. The earliest, the earliest communities were, were, they would bind together and try to help each other. The Acts of the Apostles was probably written, I'm going to guess, I wasn't there even, but I'm going to guess probably about the year 75. 75, 76, somewhere along in there was when St. Luke wrote his history. Um, thank heavens he did because we wouldn't have any other, we wouldn't have any other uh, explanations of stuff that went on, you know, early on if it weren't for, if it weren't for Luke's Acts of the Apostles. The thing I want to talk about was how, when they got together, um, I think I brought this with me, I think I did. Just wanted to tell you a little bit about those house churches. They called them, they called these house churches where people would meet, they call it, oh my gosh, this doesn't work too good. Oh, that's better. Mm -hmm. Domus Ecclesiae, meaning... <clears throat> Domus meaning house, <clears throat> place a meaning church. So they were considered to be home churches, okay? Because like I mentioned, that you know there were no there were no physical church buildings back then. Um, they were they weren't allowed. And so people would gather together in these in these church these uh, uh, churches in people's homes. Usually they were from more affluent people who had maybe a larger home, you know, and they could invite their friends and neighbors to come and uh, come and worship. And they would even provide a meal, probably. They would be try to be secure, so everyone there was secure. A priest would come, a bishop, and they would celebrate what we call the, the Eucharist, okay? Some of them were even called titulus, but most of them were called the Domus Ecclesiae, they were, uh, there were several of those. I had the opportunity of visiting one of those, and it was the one, I can't tell you the name of it now. I should have looked all that up, shouldn't I? But anyway, it was one near, uh, near the Circus Maximus. And the Circus Maximus, remember, is the place where um, a lot of the, uh, what do you call them, chariot races went, you know, it was in Circus Maximus. And a lot of people were also killed there in Circus Maximus. A lot of the Christians were led there. And then they would release the tigers or whomever, you know, the animals to, to kill, to kill the, the, uh, 
early Christians. It wasn't a pretty scene for sure, you know. Also, some of them were killed in the, um, the big thing. What am I thinking? You know what I mean? Colosseum, the Colosseum. But most of them were killed in what's called the Circus Maximus. It's a huge, huge area. Oh, golly, I don't know. You know, you think about the University of Michigan having that great big football stadium, you know. It would, it would get in one, you could get in one place for that Circus Maximus. When you drive by it, you just go a long time. It was a huge, huge area that people would come and watch the chariot races, and then they would also, that's where they killed a lot of the early Christians, was in the Circus Maximus. So <clears throat> there were a lot of those, and there was one of those, one of those uh, uh, church houses right near, uh, right near the Circus Maximus, and you just had to know about it. Well, I was there with, with a friend, and he, he studied over there to be a priest, and then he decided he didn't want to do that. So he left the seminary, and then he married, and now he has four children. And he's a teacher of, he's a, now he's president of a university in Dublin, Ireland. Well, he knew about this place. And so we went over there. We got a cab, and we went over to that place and just had the cab wait there, you know. We just walked around and looked at it. You could see that it probably at one time was a huge place for those people. Right now, it would just be probably a normal house, you know. But back then, it was probably one of the larger homes in, 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 all, of, uh, in all of that area around Rome. So <clears throat> anyway, um, that's where they would go, and that's where they would start celebrating our faith. In Rome, I'm going to tell you just a little bit about their four major basilicas. A basilica is a, is, a, is a church dedicated by the Pope as having some type of special uh, specialness about it. It could be, uh, like for example, University of Notre Dame, there's a basilica there because the fact of, you know, the, the education part. Other, other places around the United States, there are other basilicas, you know. Churches that are designated because they had some type of special influence, if you will, some type of special influence on Catholicism and, and what our church teaches. Well, prior to all of this, way back in the 300s, there were four, there were four basilicas in Rome. There's the Basilica of St. Mary Major, the Basilica of St. John Lateran, the Basilica, of course, of St. Peter, which is very familiar to us. And there's another Basilica of St. Paul outside the walls. Now, all that means is Rome used to be used to be surrounded by walls to protect them from enemies, you know, the barbarians. So they, they built these big high, and they're still there. You, you can drive and you drive along the street there, and all of a sudden you see this great big huge wall. Of course, now it's used just to, as a history part, you know. But at one time, they were really necessary, you know, to, they'd have a guy on a watchtower. If some enemy was coming, he would blow the whistle of some way or another to notify the soldiers around that wall, be on your guard, there's an enemy coming, you see? So the church, the Basilica of St. Paul is what they call extra muro, which Italian means outside the wall, okay? Just tell you a little bit about those, <clears throat> those four basilicas. St. Saint, Mary Major, on August the 4th or 5th, uh, in the year, the early 350s, um, there was a, uh, the Blessed Mother appeared to some rich, rich Roman nobleman whose name was John. And the Pope at that time was a man by the name Pope Liberius. And Mary appeared to this fella. <laughs> Are we okay? Need a close up. Okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> so the Blessed Mother appeared to this guy and said, "I want a church built here, so people can come and worship." Well, you see, prior to that, in the year 313, there was a man named Constantine, who was the emperor of Rome. He was a pagan. He was not Christian. But when he was made the emperor 
in the early 300s, he saw the dedication, if you will, the commitment, the loyalty of the Christian people. And so he sent out a decree from the city of Milan, which is in northern Italy. It's called the Edict of Milan. It was in the year 313, and Constantine sent out this decree saying, Christians are able to publicly worship publicly, you know. So that's when he started building churches. There were no churches built for the first 300 years of our faith. It was all, you know, like I said, they were scared, you know. There were a lot of persecutions, a lot of problems. So at any rate, in 313, they started building churches. Well, in the early 350s is when our Blessed Mother appeared to this guy and said, go to Pope Liberius and tell him we ought to build a church here. He did, and the Pope said, what? What? What are you saying? The Blessed Mother appeared to me. What? Really? Yeah. Well, the Pope didn't know whether to believe him or not. So the Blessed Mother appeared to John again and said, go back to the Pope and ask him to build a church here. Now we can worship publicly. I want a church built right here. It's what they call Escaline Hill. Now a hill is not like we think of a hill. A hill in, in Rome is a little incline about like that, you know. That's a hill. Well, that's where the Blessed Mother wanted this church to be built. Well, the Pope said, just ask her, is she going she gonna to appear to you again? The guy said, I don't know. All I know is she wants a church built here. He said, well, if she appears again, tell her I want a sign. Well, this is August the 5th. Rome in the summertime is just like here, hotter than blue blazes. If you're going to go to Rome, try to avoid July and August. It's really, really hot over there those two months. But you still have a great time, I'll tell you that. So at any rate... The Blessed Mother appeared, and as John said, yeah, give me a sign. The Pope says, if you give him a sign, he'll build a church here. And the Blessed Mother said, okay, tell him, when he comes out here tomorrow, there will be snow covered all over this hill. You can imagine John's thinking, snow in Rome in August? Come on now. She said, there will be snow here. So he went back and he told the Pope again. Well, here's what the Mother Mary said, that on that hill where she wants this church built, there's going to be snow there tomorrow. And the Pope said, well, I'll go, but I'm sure there's not going to be any snow there. So he and John went out to this hill. And when they approached the hill, here it was, snow, probably about this deep, you know, all over that hill. And the Pope went and got a stick. And he went in the snow, and he measured out a square like this in the snow. And he said, we'll build the, build the church right here. That was about the year 352, 353, something like that. So that's the first. Now it's a huge basilica, of course. They built on top of that and around it, over it, around it. See what I mean? It's a huge building now, the Church of St. Mary Major. Then the next one is St. John Lateran. St. John Lateran... Uh, is another basilica in Rome. It's a huge church. And how that happened was there was a family called the Laternos. And they were very wealthy people. And they had a lot of property, you see. So they wanted to build a church. And they wanted to build a church in honor of and memory of St. John the Baptist and St. John the Apostle. And so the Pope says, Let's see if we can build it out here on this hill, if you will, away from, it's kind of, it's kind of near, it's not in real downtown Rome, it's out to the east of Rome, a little bit south of, of the city of Rome. So they got their wares together, and they built that church, and they call it St. John Lateran. Lateran only because the family that owned the property was so generous, giving them all of that acreage, the names were Laterno. So the church is called really just St. John. But they honored those people who donated all that land and called it St. John Ladder. Okay? The next one, of course, you're more, <clears throat> excuse me, you'd be more familiar with is St. Peter's. Okay? Um, a church was first constructed there over the tomb of St. Peter. 
St. Peter, remember, he died a, a crucifixion death. But when they were getting ready to crucify him, he said, I'm not worthy to be crucified the way you did Jesus. Do me upside down. So they tied his arms and, and, his, and his arms and legs and put it upside down. And that's how he died. It was pretty much a suffocation, I would imagine, you know. So St. Peter died. Well, they, 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 knew where he, they knew where he died. And some of the Christians came and got him, took him over a little ways from where they crucified him, and they buried him. Well, then they decided they wanted to build a church over that spot where St. Peter was buried. And hence the Basilica of St. Peter. There again, you know, if you walk in the back of St. Peter's and look ahead, you got at least a couple of football fields. You know what I mean? It's that, it's that long. It, it's huge. Huge. Unbelievable. Unbelievable church. I've had the opportunity, fortunately, about four or five times to, to be in that church. And it's just, uh, you guys got to go to Rome, is all I got to tell you. <laughs> so much wonderful things to see and to do. Um, Constantine is the one who really built the first basilica in its place there about the year 325. Um, as I said, he was not in the year 313. Constantine was a pagan. He was not Christian. Never been baptized, never knew too much about who Jesus was or anything. But he started learning about him. Then he was baptized and became a Christian. Constantine did. And all his retinue, they call it, you know, all his family and all the people who worked with him and for him and everything, they all became Christian. So that happened probably about 316, 318, somewhere along in there, okay? So in about seven years later is when he decided he wanted to build a big church. Because his idea of a big church was a room about half the size of the room we're in, you know? So they built that and it became the Basilica of St. Peter. And they discovered where people... According to legend and according to people who, you know, handed down their information, it was, it was a time when Peter was crucified and he was buried. And so they tried to find that spot. And so that's where they built the first church of the Basilica of St. Peter. The last one was it's the Basilica of St. Paul. Uh, Paul was martyred along with several other the early Christians, in the 60s and 70s and 80s, okay, uh, after Jesus died and rose from the dead. And he was buried, again, in that area where there's now the Basilica. That's where, that's where Paul uh, was buried. And so they got a big church there. I, I wrote down, I forget, it burned. When did, oh, in, in 1823, there was a big fire and that basilica was pretty much destroyed. So it's rebuilt now, you know. Um, the only thing they were, it's funny, the only thing they said when they, they got out, so out of line, you know, they couldn't, they couldn't even fight the fire. When they finally, the fire finally died down, the only thing that was still intact, with no fire, no corruption at all, was where Paul was buried and his friend Titus, who was also an accompanist of him, who also preached the message. Their tombs and everything around them was fine. The rest of the basilica was destroyed. Isn't that crazy? So they built a new one. This was in the 1800s. So I think probably about 1850, they were able to dedicate and to bless the new basilica uh, of St. Paul. Okay, so those are the four major churches in Rome. St. Mary Major, St. Peter's, St. John Lateran, and St. Paul. Okay. Anybody got any questions? I've been talking a lot. <laughs> God in heaven. Well, anyway, I just want to lead you up to what happened. Well, from then on, there were lots and lots of people being baptized, you know, in the 400s and 500s. And a lot of, a lot of people were coming on to being baptized and, and coming on to learning about Jesus, you know. And so that went extremely well. In the 800s and 900s, it's like sometimes happens, you know. People have their own ideas about things. And they want to start changing things. And they, they started getting involved in, in the, the money part of church. 
and stealing money. And it was just, it got to be a mess, to be honest, you know. You have to hang out your dirty laundry, don't you? The church wasn't always pristine pure. There were a lot of problems in the 800s, 900s, 1100s. There were a lot, there was one point, one point there where there were like two or three different guys who claimed to be the Pope. I mean, it was just, it was just craziness that went on, you know. And I always think about this, you know, if, if our church wasn't a real uh, dedicated church founded by Jesus, it would have never persisted with all of that. There were so many problems, you know. There were so many problems that went on. And yet our church continued to be there, continued to grow. It continued, <clears throat> excuse me, continued to be the real sign, if you will, of the message of Jesus around the world, okay? Back then, you know, we were called the New World, and that wasn't until the 15th century, you know? So most of it was European. But all the Europeans understood that was the true church, established by Christ, carried on by his apostles and disciples way back in the 100s, written, about, written by uh, St. Luke in, in the Acts of the Apostles. However, as I said, there were a lot of abuses. A lot of things just weren't right that were going on in our church, you know. Um, so there was a, a group of some Catholic priests. Uh, two of them were belonged to the, to the Order of St. Augustine. They were called Augustinian priests. One named Martin Luther, the other one Calvin. There was another one who joined him named Zwingli. Those three are considered to be the, quote, reformers, Okay. And so that's how then, if you look, if I can, uh, maybe this one will work better. Yeah, this is good. If you look to Jesus, okay, there's a direct line from Jesus down to us today. Okay? What happened with a lot of problems in here, right here, in about the 15th century, late 1400s, this is when you see the split in the Catholic Church. And that came about through Martin Luther. Now, once you understand something about that, though, you know, Martin Luther, he, he wasn't totally off base at all. He wasn't. He saw some of the abuses, you know. He saw some of the things that were going on in the church that were not right. And, and he had, a, he had a, a legitimate protest, if you will. Hence the name Protestant, because he was protesting, you see. But he, he wasn't wrong in a lot of ways. He, uh, he went to Wittenberg in Germany, hung up his 95 Theses. You've probably seen all that in history, you know. I hung up the Theses, 95 Theses, which those were, what he saw were abuses within the church, and how the church had to be changed. Well, uh, then uh, Calvin followed him and also Zwingli. And so this is where we see then a division in, in our church. Okay? There was a division in the church and there were some people who followed him. There were some people who wanted to follow Calvin. They're now called Methodist Presbyterian. And there were some other ones who, you know, it was in the year, about the, I think it was about the year 1517. He started giving a rumbling here at the end of the 1400s. But I think it's in the year 1517 when Martin Luther hung up his thesis, the 95 thesis, on the front doors of the church in Wittenberg, Germany. Then came Calvin, um, then came Zwingli, then they, then they came about the Church of England. Henry VIII went to get on the, on the deal, you know, about him. Well, Henry VIII had to get in about all this stuff, you know. Well, anyway, in the year 1545, 1545 to 1563, there was something called the Council or the Meeting, Council of Trent. Now, it, it didn't last for 18 years. There was sometimes, and what, what the council was, it was a meeting of all the bishops, 
around the world. They were all invited and called to come to Rome to try to find out how we can get things. The things were getting so this split here. You see, there was this, and then there were people coming off of this one, off of this one, and you had all the splits here. Well, we wanted to get back of, of, one, of one communion of our church. And so they called the Council of Trent. Pope Paul III must have been a good guy because he's the one who kind of called it and said, we need all to get together. Let's all get together and find out what were the teachings of Jesus. And if we're doing something wrong, let's admit it and get it straightened out. You see? Well, he particularly invited Martin Luther to come. But Luther refused to come. So you don't know where we'd be today had Luther said, okay, Pope Paul, I'll come and let's dialogue. Let's figure this whole thing out. But Luther refused to come. And so they went ahead. And then what the Council of Trent did, it really kind of set for us what the church was all about and the direction it was going to take. Does that make sense? That's what the Council of Trent was all about. And they really tried to unify things. See, Luther's ideas, I said, weren't totally all bad at all. He had, he had some good gripes, if you will. He had some good complaints. But the problem was this. And this is the thing the popes and the early bishops, I mean, the bishops in this time here, were trying to help him to understand is, there are certain things, certain entities, if you will, that Jesus established. And we can't change those. Those came from Jesus, you see. But Luther, he said, no, those were just all man-made. What we're talking about are the sacraments. We still in our church have what we call the seven sacraments. And second semester, we'll go through those sacraments and explain each one of them to y'all. But Luther wouldn't accept the sacrament of reconciliation, of Eucharist, anointing of the sick, marriage, and all that. He would, not, he would not go along with those being sacraments, meaning something holy instituted by Jesus. That's basically what a sacrament is. Okay, It's something that Jesus gave to us. The only ones he wanted to keep, basically, the one was baptism. That was a sacrament. He said, we have to have baptism. Beyond that, we don't need any of those other ones. Well, the Pope at that time, as I said, was Paul III, and the bishops there, they tried to let him know, you know, look, you know, we cannot, we cannot kind of throw the baby out with the wash. You know what I mean by that? You know, there are certain things that Jesus handed down to us, and we have to employ those. We have to keep those. Those are sacred because Jesus established them. He founded those things for us in order for ways for him to come into our lives at different points of our lives. But Luther would not recount any of that. And so hence, that was really the split. Okay? And so those other, those other, they called them Protestant churches. You know, they called them Protestant only because back then they were protesting. It's kind of unreal to call them Protestant now, you know. You just call them other Christian churches, you know. Because those people are Christian, you know. And the Baptist church, the Lutheran church, whatever, you know. Those people are Christian. They're following Jesus, aren't they? We used to always call them, well, that's a Protestant church, you know. Well, that's kind of archaic, really, you know. It was called Protestant back in the 16th century because those people were protesting. And like I said, folks, some of the things they were protesting were right, you know. We needed a shakeup, so to speak, okay. We needed, we needed to get ourselves back in line with Jesus and those apostles, we kind of got sideways with some of that stuff. And what happened was a lot of humanists came in, you know. When you get human beings together, sometimes it doesn't always work right. <laughs> you know what I mean? And that's what happened with our church. Some of those early popes, uh, some of the leaders of the church, um, they, were more, they were more interested in what it was going to do for them. Kind of power hungry, you know. And it really wasn't... It wasn't in line with the early church, the first, second, third centuries of our church, you know. It all kind of got sideways. Well, Luther saw that. He was a Catholic priest, you know. He saw all that, and he wanted to change it. The only problem, he went too far in the area, particularly in the area of sacraments. 
and they tried to explain to him what our teaching was with that and how you can look at scripture and see how Jesus established or founded each of those sacraments you know but he would not he would not recant that he said no the only sacrament the only, only sacrament is baptism you know they do have communion service in, in some of those churches you know but it's just in memory of you know they used to have grape juice and wafers or something you know and they pray and everything golly those you know those people are good people you know people today in those in those christian churches around, around our city around our neighborhood they're all good people you know they're all good people heck they'll probably get to heaven quicker than i will but but you know they they, they don't have they don't have that connection this connection here that's so important for us to understand our church today goes all the way back to jesus and the apostles okay can i sit down yes please good I, it's about all i know <laughs> it's about all i know about this stuff oh my gosh any questions do i have any ideas you mentioned a third person Ziegler, where, what, the, what church did you see? Zwingli? Zwingli. Zwingli, Z-W-I-N-G-L-I. -I. If you ever around Beach Grove, if you drive out of Beach Grove and go up Churchman Avenue, there's an area that says the Reformers, and those streets are named Luther, Calvin, Zwingli. Isn't that fun? <laughs> right there in Beach Grove, Indiana, by golly. <laughs> right there, we're Grovers. But uh, yeah, he established what we know today probably is an outgrowth of Lutheranism. However, those guys then decided to agree to disagree. You know, when, when particularly Calvin and Luther, they were buddies trying to get things reformed and everything, which they were right, you know, golly. But then, a few years down the road, they got in arguments about things, and so they went their separate ways. And that's how we get now the Presbyterian, you know, the Baptist, Luther, Luther over here, you know, and so Zwingli was kind of an offshoot of, of Lutheranism. Zwingli, Z-W-I-N-G-L-I. -I. He was one of the three reformers. Luther, Calvin, and Zwingli. 500 years ago, I think, right? I think it all happened 500 years ago, you know? As I said, the people in those churches, for the most part, they're good people. My golly. They're Christian people, you know? Uh, they don't hold on to the truths we do. Our truths, you know, came from the scripture and a tradition, obviously. We get our faith from two, uh, two sources, scripture and tradition. Our faith is based on those two things, the scriptures and tradition. And when we get to the second semester, when you all, when you all study the sacraments, we'll show in the scripture and the gospels where Jesus instituted those particular sacraments, you know. And Luther just had a problem with that for... No, for whatever reason, I don't know why. He had, he had a problem with that, you know, and he he wouldn't uh, he wouldn't adhere to those being basic truths taught by Jesus. And when they tried to show him that, he he would not he would not change his mind. So that's when the Council of Trent came along in 1545. They invited him to come, like I said. And they were really hoping he would come so they could dialogue, you know, and try to try to say, well, here here here's our tradition. Here's what the scriptures say. Here's what's been handed down to us from the, the apostles, the early disciples, the early people in our church back in the first, second, third century. Here's the way, here's the way it was, you see. But he decided he, he didn't want to talk about it. He made up his mind and, and he didn't he didn't want to he didn't want to dialogue, I guess, so to speak. You know, he he didn't want to he didn't want to get into he knew what he believed and what he was establishing in his churches. <clears throat> but the interesting thing, I found, I'll tell you this little side story. I was out in the from near 1990 to 1990. It's an interesting story. Paul Schmoll was here. I moved in in the year 1990 to St. Michael. He lived right down the street. Said, I moved in and he sold his house and moved. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the neighborhood went to heck. And when I moved in. I, I had a premonition that you would come to St. Rock. Oh, I, I see. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Anyway, I went to St. Michael's in the year 1990, and there was this fella, there's a um, uh, Christian church up on um, Kessler Boulevard, Cold Springs. It's one of those. It's right off the interstate, Paul. What, what's that? Kessler. Kessler, okay. 
And he was the nicest guy, great big tall guy, just a wonderful fella. And he was pastor of a church there, a Christian church there on Kessler Boulevard. So he came to me one day and he said, you know, what would you think about if we get all the Christian churches in our area out here on the west side, you know, to get together and we'll have a Thanksgiving, have a Thanksgiving, a little supper of some sort. People can bring canned goods, we can give to the poor, and we have a little prayer service. All of us get together. Oh, that sounds good to me, you know. So he said, I'll host it here at our church. He said, I'd like for you to go. And he gave me about three or four churches in the area to go visit those pastors, you know, and tell them what we're, what we're wanting to do and how, how it's going to work. And he said, we can't do it on Thanksgiving because I know you Catholics, you have your mass, Thanksgiving Day mass on Thanksgiving. And I said, yeah, let's have it on Wednesday night before Thanksgiving. I said, that, that works good. That works good. So I went down on Tibbs and 16th Street, just a little bit uh, north of that and east of that, there was a little Baptist church. So I found out about that, went there, met the minister. It was a woman, and she was wonderful. She was really a, a great woman, you know, full of faith, you could tell, you know. Really, really a wonderful, wonderful person. So I told her about this gathering one to have. And she says, oh, my gosh, I'll, yeah, we'll be part of that. That's neat. She said, I said, you tell your congregation, we're going to go up to the church or what it was we're going to have it, you know, on a Wednesday before Thanksgiving. Sold her right away. She was all for it. She thought that was a great idea. Well, then I went over on West 30th Street, right before the Speedway, right before you get into Gate 10 of the Motor Speedway, you know. There was a church, another Baptist church sitting there, another Baptist church. So I went and met that fella and told him, you know, what we wanted to do and how it was going to work and everything. And he was all for it, you know. And I said, I said, well, you know, Mrs. So-and-so down at the Baptist church there on right off of Tibbs, they're going to come. And he just got real stern. He said, they're coming. <laughs> and I said, yes, sir. Baptist, Baptist. You know. He said, if they're coming, we're not coming. By the way, I thought they were both Baptists. Well, they're not Baptists, but they weren't friendly Baptists to each other. <laughs> now, whatever happened with that, I have no idea. But that's always stuck in my mind, you know. Um, you know, with our church, I don't mean to throw this down your all's throats, but, you know, we have a unity of belief, of liturgy. You know what I mean? No matter where, for example, yesterday or Sunday, we celebrated the second Sunday of Advent. We had three different scripture readings. If you'd go to a church in France, they'd be celebrating the second Sunday of Advent with those three scripture readings. Germany, Italy, Mexico, wherever you would go, and you go to a Catholic church, there's that unity, you know? There's a unity of worship. There's, there, there's a unity of, you know, that we all call Pope Francis our leader, you know? He's our Pope. Now, can Francis just come out and say, Okay, I'm going to throw out two of the sacraments. No, no, he's, I can't do that, you know. He's more a physical leader, you know. He makes suggestions. He's making one now about the end of the Our Father. I'm thinking, glory be to God. You know, where it says, and lead us not into temptation. He said, God will never lead you into temptation. He might have some, but we've been saying it that way for how many years? I don't know. Francis, I'm all for it the way we're doing, but you do whatever you want to do. You know? mm -hmm. So they're, they're just discussing stuff like that. But he can, you know, he's really given us a direction on reaching out in charity and kindness to the needy. That's been a thing that's been Francis' manta, if you will, is to take care of the poor and the needy, you know. Um, he, um, he had this one guy, I think he was a Monsignor, that worked over there in a finance office and he was probably pretty set with himself you know he thought he was pretty important and francis said i got a job for you oh good he's probably gonna make me a bishop so, you know. francis said here's a job bud i want you to figure out how much money is in this account someone tell me that and we're going to take money out of that every week and i want you then to go to the streets of rome and buy food for the poor and the homeless that guy's still doing it today you know that's his job. Before he had a job, you know, pushing numbers in the Vatican. So that was real important, you know. Well, Francis got rid of that in a hurry, you know. No, here's what you got to do. We got to help people who are homeless, people who don't have food and clothing, a place to, 
place to lay down and go to bed at night, you know. So he's really given us a direction. The Pope is really somebody who wants to do, along with his cabinet, if you will, along with his advisors, the cardinals, and all the other people, give us a direction on where our church should be going. What, how we should be reaching out to whom and how do we do that? And try to help people understand more and more about our faith. You see? And that's what Francis is doing. So, uh, where did I get off on Francis? What was I talking about? Oh, run that thing back. No, don't run that thing back. <laughs> um, anyway, um, I think that's the thing we have of that unity. There's unity of belief, unity of worship, unity of governance, if you will, um, that's been with the Catholic Church since day one. And we're kind of proud of that, you know, that we have that, hello, that's okay. They want to tell you that they want you to go Christmas shopping, right? No, that's the alarm for my dog's medicine. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> What's the matter with it? She has seizures. Oh, does she? So you got medicine for her, though. So she has to take medicine. How old is she? She's 11. Oh, okay. My dog is six. Annie. She's a golden doodle. Oh. She is something else, I'll tell you. I had a golden retriever for 14 years. And she died, and no more dog. I cried for three days. I no more, no more dogs. I'm not gonna have another dog, you know. Well, guess what? These people said we looked because you know I had to run the sweeper almost every day with with Nala, with my golden retriever. She shed all winter long, all summer long. It didn't make a difference. She just shed all the time. I don't know how she had poor dog had any hair left. <laughs> I would brush her and get big balls of hair, you know. And go in and she go back in the house and there'd be hair there, hair there, hair there. <laughs> oh my gosh. Where's all that hair coming from? But anyway, she died. She was a great, great dog. And uh, her name was Nala. But she had a brother named Simba. Where's that from? <laughs> Lion, Lion King. King, right. And then she died. And so six years ago now, someone said, you got another dog. I said, no, I, I'm done with dogs. Well, you know how far that went. So we got Annie. And he was seven weeks old. Don't get a seven-week-old puppy. <laughs> I was ready to give her back to the Indians or wherever she came from. Oh, my God. That dog was into everything and biting on everything and chewing things. I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, what am I going to do with her? I had this cage I had her in at night, you know. When I would finally get ready to go to bed, I would pick her up, take her in, put her in her house, I call it, put her in her cage, lock the door, shut the door of the room she was in, I'd go, <laughs> boy, that was a struggle today. <laughs> well, anyway, she's real smart. You know, she only went to the bathroom twice in my house. And she was broke. From then on, she knew right to go to the back door and let her out. She'd go out, go to the bathroom outside. She's a smart girl. She's a golden doodle. Yeah, I still got her. Oh, boy, oh boy, do I. <laughs> she is a, she's a great, great dog. She's a lot of company for me, you know. Live by myself in that house, you know. It's just great to have Annie around. I talk to her all the time. I think she knows what I say. <laughs> I think she does. Smart girl. Well, what else do you want to know? I well, suppose as much as I can do about church history up to the Reformation. You can take them the Reformation on to today, you know, how that all transpired and what went on and how our church kind of refocused itself, you know, and it's still refocusing itself, which is good, which is very good. We still maintain those ideas and values Jesus taught. We can't do anything. We can change some things, but there's certain things we don't change and can't change because Jesus gave them to us, you see, and those are what we hold on to. Now, the practice, you know, like, for example, it used to be the Mass around the world was in Latin, in every country. Well, the Second Vatican Council, which took place from 1958 to 1963, um, that council uh, said we ought to be able to celebrate the sacraments in our own language, the vernacular, they call it. And so if you go to Mass in Spain, the Mass will be in Spanish. If you go to Mass... In France, they say Mass in French. Here, we use English. You see what I mean? So that's what the vernacular means. It's the same, nothing's changed. It's the same Mass. 
The only thing is in the language of the people. And that was their goal. That was the goal. They wanted it so that everybody would be able better to understand the words of, of the Eucharist that we're celebrating. Okay? Have a cookie. It's eight. Oh my gosh, it's after eight o'clock. You should ring a bell. Sorry. Okay. I gotta hear about Annie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know about Annie. I know. About all the kids know about Annie. The kids in our school all know about Annie. Why did you name her Annie? Because her mother dog was Annie. And you know she kept hearing the people who bred dogs down on the farm, down by North Vernon, Seymour, that area. We went to this farm, and that was the funniest thing. I drove the farm, went under. It's a huge, big, big farm. And I pulled up there, and there was about three or four golden retrievers come out to the car. One great big, I opened the door, one great big guy came, put his big old head right here on my lap, you know, wagging his tail. And the, the woman who runs the, the, the dad, the father of that family, runs the farm, and she does with him, but she also breeds these golden doodles. And, uh, she said, oh, come here, man. She said, Annie, Annie, get over here. And that was the female dog who had these pups. They had four puppies when we got there, two boys and two girls. Well, I knew I wanted a girl dog. I just think they're easier to handle. Now, maybe they are, maybe they are. That's just what I think. So, but it didn't work out that way with Annie when she was a baby. <laughs> she was not so easy to handle. Annie was. Annie was a little booger, I'll tell you. And she knew it. She knew right away. That she, yeah, she's a great creature. I hope your doggy gets okay. Oh, she'll be all right. Be okay. Yeah, she she's had him for years. I'll be darned. And so you give her kind of medicine. Peanut barbecue. Yeah, I just say peanut. Yeah. Just like you give to a person. Yeah. Yes, three yeah. times a day. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Three times a day. Two times. Two times a day. I see. Okay. Eight in the morning and eight at night. Yep. I'm late. I held you here too late. Right. I'm sorry. Right. Don't worry about it. Okay. What's next week? Oh, next week is the is the Christmas concert. Right. If you guys have never had the opportunity to hear our adult choir Christmas concert, I would suggest you come next week. Doors open Tuesday night, December 19th at 7 o'clock. There's no admission. Other, we just ask you to bring a pair of gloves or a stocking cap or something like that. And we take all that stuff down uh, to Salvation Army, and they're able to distribute to the needy, particularly in downtown Indianapolis. Okay, so that's what all, we get all that stuff together, and <clears throat> the next day after the concert, we put it all in my trunk of my car and go down. And those people are always thrilled. I think they know we're probably coming, you know, because we've been doing this now for several years, and taking all the hats and gloves and scarves and all that, you know, and it's really helpful to people, particularly at night like this. You're on the street, you know. You need a good coat, and hat, and gloves, and everything. <clears throat> so that's uh, a week from tonight. That is our Christmas. Credit, right? Yes, you'll get extra credit. <laughs> What's that? I'll get extra credit for attending. Yeah, you get extra credit. That's right. Yeah, sure extra you do. Points. But you re you will enjoy it. I'll tell you that. If you've never been, you'll re it gets you in the. If if you're not already in a Christmas spirit, most of us are, I guess. But if you're not, that'll really put you there. Church will be decorated. Hey, the mm -hmm. church will be decorated. We're decorating our church early this year, uh, just so that it's all decorated for the Christmas concert. That's another thing the parish council does. Yeah, that's right. That's right. All good. Okay. Well, nice being with all of you. If I don't get to see you personally, have a wonderful Christmas. May God bless you and all your loved ones. Okay. Thank you. Get a cookie. Before you go, also before you go, don't leave without. If you weren't, if you well, if you weren't here last week or two weeks ago, when we talked about Mary and the saints, um, have holy cards of Saint Mother Theodore Guerin and Saint Rock. If you weren't here to get one of those last time, get one. And then a, one of our great um, prayers in our church to to Mary is the Memorari. So here's a card with that. We have CDs. Um, that are just kind of like a book on tape, these CDs of different topics about our faith um, and cookies. And as uh, uh, early Christmas, well, this is an early Christmas present that I wish that I had two weeks ago. But um, this is Saints for Our Times. You know, we talked about how important it is to learn about the saints and to use their 
example. Yeah. So, um, everybody gets one of those, everybody gets one of those, and then we'll put the rest deal. on the kiosk. <laughs> but don't, game now, right? don't get confused, <laughs> one side is in Spanish and the other side is in English. I didn't realize that, but it's okay because you can read it either way, whatever way you choose, <laughs> English or Spanish. But it's there in its entirety in both languages. Okay, so there you go. We've got thanks, honey. Thank you, very Father. Much. You can have your copy too. Thank you so got, much. Yeah, everybody grab one of those St. Gills, okay? St. Ignatius Loyola, St. Francis of Labor, St. Teresa of Ireland, St. Tom of Cross. Yeah, just like yeah. Good. Thank you. Thanks for being here tonight.